Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar presentation. This is Michael Saltzman, and I'm the director of digital products at Blue Sky Bio. I hope everyone is staying safe, staying healthy, staying at home. And we're continuing with our ongoing webinar series, Viral Dental Education, during this time period. We have our schedule posted on blueskyplan.com forward slash webinars 2020. There's a link on the same page, past recorded webinars, so you could take a look at those as well. If you're attending the presentation live, as usual, we'll be sending the CE credit directly to your inbox. If you're watching a recording, then upon the completion of the recording, please complete the 10 question multiple choice test and we will be able to send you the CE credit. If you have any questions during the webinar presentation, please type them into the question and answer box and they'll be addressed towards the end of the presentation. Today, we're going to be hearing a presentation, a lecture on the topic of basic implant prosthodontics, fixed and removable. Dr. Mangalo, you are the chairman of the Live Implant Training Institute and you've trained over 1,200 dentists. Can you? Tell us a little bit about that. Are you training on guided surgery, computer guided surgery, free-handed surgery? Hey, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, having me in this panel. I uh, hope you're doing okay over there, Michael. And yep. uh, it's a sunny, nice day over here in Florida. And we're taking a break from writing the book. Uh, I decided to, um, to use this, make good usage of this uh, coronavirus time and uh, we're on page 200 of our uh, new book. Hopefully we'll be done by the time this crisis is over. And yes, uh, we teach uh, in both of the institutes, uh, we teach free-handed surgeries. In one of the institutes, which is in Nicaragua, we, every case is planned using uh, CT scans and 3D images. Um, we don't teach at the, uh, in this courses using uh, computer guided uh, surgical guides simply because uh, it's a little uh, more time taken as far as screening the patients and preparing them. So uh, in all of the, uh, all of the surgeries are performed freehanded. But like I said, in, in one of the institutes, we plan everything with uh, CT scans and we found interesting ways to uh, teach the doctors how to look at the bone topography and how to look at landmarks that will allow you to uh, kind of extrapolate what you see on the scan and make the, uh, the plan happen, uh, even that you're not using a surgical guide. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Your recommendation generally to use surgical guides on all cases, on most cases, or what do you tell uh, new dentists? I, I, gotta, I gotta tell you, I, I would say, um, I would like all of the dentists to first learn, obviously they wanna learn how to look at a scan, uh, read a scan, treat, be able to treatment plan it, which I believe you guys have uh, very easy and nice modules uh, in Blue Sky Bio plan. Um, but uh, coming from an oral surgery uh, training, uh, I want dentists to be able to open a flap and look at the bone and be able to to get a feel for the bone. Uh, once you do that and you're comfortable being able to do that, then jumping into computer guided surgeries with a surgical guide uh, should be very easy and very predictable. Um, so in my practice, uh, right now I actually sold my practices, but uh, I was in practice for 27 years. And I would say that in the last five years of uh, uh, my private practice, I think 35% of all my surgeries were uh, computer guided. Now, um, I was kind of fortunate because my practice was limited to uh, uh, full arch cases. So I never did uh, uh, too many of the uh, single or, or multiple partially edentulous cases. For the young doctors, I think that would be the bread and butter uh, and there's nothing sweeter than uh, being able to plan and execute a placement of one or two 
uh, using a surgical guide. I mean, it's just, it takes you to another level. And is your book focused on fully dentulous arches or implant placement in general, or, or what's, what's your co book covering? You know what? It, it's kind of ambitious. Uh, I was, first I started writing a section. I thought it was going to be just uh, full arch immediate loading. Uh, in doing this, I realized I couldn't limit it to it uh, because we had to also show the final res uh, restorations. So then we open a chapter on prosthetics, which is you guys are going to see some of those cases today. Um, uh, and after that, we we realized that we had to show uh, different usages of all the uh, uh, ESOCATS uh, systems that are out there. So we started introducing some of the circumstances uh, and the different materials that we're using, the Bertaus, the PMMAs. Uh, and from there, we, I started finding some nice uh, singles, uh, immediate uh, extractions and placements. Uh, and of course, as you move in, into your library, I started finding very nice intracrystal sinus lift. We do all of this with Blue Sky Bio uh, hammerless kit. And uh, so now it, it's, I would say it's a accumulation of singles, multiples, uh, immediates, intracrystals, uh, full arches. Uh, Raymond uh, Rofi, who's here in uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale in, in Florida, he's going to contribute with uh, computer guided uh, treatment planning from singles to uh, full arches uh, and all, everything in between. So, so it's a combination of uh, almost everything that you're going to be seeing in, uh, in implant dentistry nowadays. Okay, and, the, and you expect that the book will be done in uh, the next few weeks, eh? Yes, yes. Like I said, we're at 200 pages. In, in the next month, we're doing, I want to say, the last two revisions. Uh, so hopefully in two months, uh, it's going to be it's gonna be out and done. Amazing. It, well, it would I... never happen if it hadn't been for uh, my time being home. <laughs> great use of the time, and it's a great way to find uh, the silver lining in uh, the current situation. You know what? I, I have a blog. I don't know if you're in my blog. Uh, and I tell everybody... You know, whatever is happening, it, it, it's, it, it's terrible, but we have to find, uh, we have to keep busy with, with other things and be productive. Uh, we can't focus on, on, on just the negative. So uh, there's a lot of things that, just like me, I had this book. I mean, I've written a book before, but I've been wanting to do a, a more serious book in the last seven years. You never find the time. So what better time than now, right? Sure, definitely. Okay, um, so let's get to the topic at hand for today. If you could go ahead and uh, share your screen and uh, start your presentation. All right. Get started. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Give me a second. It's asking me for a password. Okay, there we go. Okay, I can see your desktop now. All right. Yep, now I see the presentation. All right, we're there? Yep. All right, so um, so welcome everyone. And uh, today's topic is basic implant prosthodontics. We're gonna talk mostly on fixed uh, and a little bit on removable. Uh, I don't wanna uh, stretch out, the, the topic is a little bit extensive. I'm gonna try to make it as uh, simple and, and useful as possible. Uh, like Raymond said, I'm Virgil Mongalo. I live in Florida. And uh, today is April 22nd. We're going to start with a, uh, a keynote article written. This is 31 years ago, 1989. I mean, so uh, this is nothing new under the sun. Uh, but I must say that uh, while training many doctors, I recognize that uh, this is the essence for understanding uh, where we should be with regards to uh, prosthodontics. And keep in mind that what you learn from Schillingberg, I think most of us uh, in the last three decades were trained with Schillingberg, 
or Peter K. Thomas uh, or Pete Dawson, uh, all of these uh, concepts on fix and removal prosthodontics, uh, they've been changing quite a bit, especially when it comes to implant prosthodontics. So this, this is a very important page uh, to keep in mind. You can find an article, just Google Carl Misch. I think it was uh, 1989. I can't tell you exactly what journal it was published, um, but it defines the five categories of prosthetics uh, available. So it, it's very simple. Don't let it get confuse you. Those FPs means fixed prosthesis. RPs means removable prosthesis. And of course, when you start with one, you're talking about ideal and down the line is the less ideal. So that's how I see it and I try to keep it simple. Um, FP1, which is the one we're gonna start with, is simply a prosthesis. And this could be a single tooth. It could be a, a small bridge, three, four units, or it could be a full arch. And what we're talking about here is a fixed restoration where only the clinical crown is gonna be restored. What this means was that probably the bone height, the bone angulation, the quality of bone, the gingiva, everything was right where it needed to be. So when you place your implants, you were able to place them in the ideal position. And therefore your restoration is going to come out to look like a natural tooth. Now we're gonna go through this in different examples. FP2 is gonna be another fixed prosthesis. Again, could be a crown, it could be small bridge, or it could be a full arch. And here we lost a little bit of the gingival tissue and the tooth is gonna look like an extended part of what it would be a tooth plus the roots. And usually we're talking about three to four millimeters. So you're gonna end up having a prosthesis that looks a little bit long, but rather than having uh, a normal central measures 10 to 11 millimeters in height, uh, if you lost three to four millimeters, you're not gonna have a 14 millimeter clinical crown. That would be absurd. You wanna have a regular 10 to 11 millimeter uh, clinical crown. In the other two or three millimeters, you can recontour them with, uh, with some type of porcelain. It could be white porcelain or it could be a uh, pink porcelain. Again, here the, there was a little bit more resorption than in FP1. And then we're gonna go on to FP3, which all of you guys that are getting familiar with the all on fours, all on six, all on eight, uh, you're looking at restorations where you have the clinical tooth plus a good amount of soft tissue being replaced anywhere from four millimeters all the way up to eight millimeters, sometimes even the height of the clinical crown, all right? So let's start with those. And then uh, I'm not gonna touch today on our RP4s. Uh, we, we're not doing this too much in private practice. So we're gonna jump on to RP5s, which are simple over dentures supported by locators or bowls or any kind of uh, uh, attachments, but they're also supported by the tissues. So the first slide here, this was presented again by Carl Misch, and you can see on the left side, top and bottom, FP1. You can see where you have your implant, and then you have there a representation of a crown coming right off in a beautiful position. So the aesthetics are gonna be maximum and everything is gonna look like you just replaced a single tooth. FP2 on the middle, you can see where the crown is a little bit elongated. And what my lab tech likes to do with this, he'll have two options. He can do it with 
porcelain, white porcelain, and he'll just create like a line and create a cervical differentiation between the clinical crown and part of the roots. Or he can add a little bit of pink there. And FP3 on the right is where you clearly have lost quite a bit of bone and soft tissues. And you're having to replace that with gingiva. It could be uh, acrylic in the case of all of those uh, dentures, fixed bridges, or it could be pink acrylic, I mean, pink uh, zirconia in the cases of the pretile bridges. So let's look right now, FP1 cosmetic reconstruction. Typically where we really would like to see this is in the aesthetic zone. This case right here, uh, all of the cases that I'm going to show you were operated by alumni that I and my team have trained in either Mexico or in Nicaragua. We have two institutes um, and we give six courses a year in Mexico and six courses a year in Nicaragua. We train exclusively with Blue Sky Bio and we have done that for the last five years. The reason for this is that we find in Blue Sky everything that we need as a clinician. They have phenomenal implant systems. Out of all the implant systems, I prefer the Biomax, which is compatible with the uh, Noble Active, a very aggressive. I, I love the thread designs on the implant systems. Uh, they also have uh, a great software, the support uh, from Michael and their team, uh, from Corey and Raymond are incredible when it comes to anything that has to do with digital uh, technology. And of course, uh, I'm, I'm, I favor the system simply because I have all the other kits that I need that some of the other companies do not, such as the Crestal Lift kits, uh, the bone expander kits, and so forth. So moving on to this FP1. So here we are. What we have here, it's an individual that, uh, as you can see, there's some crowns ill-fitting over there. Uh, this was a bridge that had come, I think it was a roundhouse, might have been section, uh, probably at the uh, second premolar area. And in the anterior, uh, the doctor that was doing this placed five implants. You can see four if you look closely on the right side, you'll see a, a fifth one. And there we're gonna be replacing six anterior teeth. Now, when you look at the frontal view here, you can appreciate that uh, we have lost basically only the height of the tooth. If you can envision that here, we're going to be able to replace this without having the need to replace any roots or soft tissues. Therefore, this is an FP1. Now, we're going to talk about basic principles. Principle number one, and there's many different theories on this. I'm going to give you what works for me, what has worked for me in the last 27 years, and also how we're adding this onto the uh, digital components that we have nowadays. We're going to start with the old school, yet very effective using open trace impression copings with long pins. If you were to take an impression with closed trace and you were just to take the material, take the impression, pull it out, there is a chance that the impression copings are going to move when you pour the master model. So what we like to do is we take a floss, we tie all of the impression post, and then we're gonna take Duralay, or if you're not trained with Duralay, you can use flowable resins. I always tell my students, you know, we have trays of flowable resins, and the ones that you never use, those ugly ones, the C4s, D4s, use them for this. Uh, you're not gonna use them usually for anything else. So I'll use all of the flowable resins, I'll tie them up, and just, and you use that floss as a uh, lattice to work around. 
And what you're gonna do is on the bottom, you're seeing an open tray. The key here is you have to use a heavy body material. You are not taking crown and bridge nat on natural teeth, where you take a tray and you use a, uh, a monoface for the base and you inject the wash. That would be too soft. You need something to compress everything and to pick up everything hard. So what we like to use is regular putty, not lab putty. They're a little bit different in consistency. And we'll fill the tray with that. And we'll take a syringe of PBS with monoface and just inject it around the tissues and around, um, around the, uh, the Duralate pattern. You take the impressions. Uh, one of the tricks here is to wet your finger as soon as the impression goes in, make sure that with your finger, you press on that material and you're able to see all of the long pins, as you can see right there on the picture. If you don't do this, you're gonna have a hell of a time trying to find them. I have seen this where someone takes the impression, they forget to do this, and now when the material is hardened, they're having to take it out. They're having to try to fish for it. They cut them with a knife or with a blade or anything else. And it just becomes a mess. So make your life simple. All right. This is the most important part to start the whole procedure. Now, that's old school. But now we're going to tie it onto new school. So our final impression is four send it to the lab. And the master model that has, the lab would scan it. You should be working with a lab that has all the digital capacities to do this. Most reputable labs have this. If a lab doesn't have this, they're probably a little bit beyond uh, their time. Uh, we have this kind of capacity in Mexico and in Nicaragua. So I'm sure that if you are in Canada or in the US, definitely your labs will have this. So on the top, you can see where the lab is starting to, has remounted digitally the case, and it's a replica of what you have in the mouth. And you can see uh, how the implants are coming out. That is crucial because as you're gonna see, restorations need to be properly designed. We use a program called Circumstance Designer, and it allows you to be able to reconstruct first the frame of this. This is gonna be a PFM, high noble metal. And then the lab also digitally is going to be able to add what it would be the porcelain. All of this is done digitally. So in this view right here, you can see how even the models follow the proper curve of speed. And of course, you have to do your job properly, giving the lab uh, the proper vertical dimension. What we find is one of the simplest ways is to simply fabricate a, an acrylic bite rim that has temporary titanium cylinders. They're screwed on onto the implants, and it has a base plate. So you take your bite with this. There's no way it can be distorted. The lab will scan this uh, base plate and it's at the same time it would merge the scans of the master models and therefore it would mount the whole case as you can see on the bottom. So on the top you have what it would be the middle structure with a two millimeters clearance for porcelain and on the bottom you can see the design of the crowns. There's your master model on the top, and that's the clinical view in the mouth. Now, a prosthetic principle to attach to this here is that for every tooth that you are replacing, you need to keep in mind that you gotta have seven millimeters of space. This applies almost everywhere except in the molar area. In the molar area, you want to have 10 millimeters simply because the molar has a greater emergence profile. So as you can see here, just envision the anteriors having 
uh, missing those 60. And the space in between that you see between the, the uh, at the laterals, uh, it's going to be covered by a pontic. Here comes the lab. Now the lab was able to mill the, uh, the metal and on, on top of it, a ceramist applied the porcelain. One of the pearls that I'm going to give you here, what you're looking for in order to have a proper FP1 cosmetic restoration is to make sure that your access holes come through the lingual. If it's in the anteriors, it has to be close to the cingulum. If it's in the posteriors, it should be close to the central fossa or on the buccal incline plane of the lingual cusp, as you can see this here. Now, what happens if this didn't happen? Well, you can use multi-unit abutments, okay? Now, when you're talking about an FP1, if you are placing a multi-unit abutment, you're actually stealing uh, restorable space from the prosthesis. I'd rather go directly to the implants because it gives me a greater and better emergence profile. Now notice in the mouth how on the lingua you can see that you have only replaced the tooth. And here's the final uh, frontal view on the model. This is an FP1. Now you might get tired of hearing me say all this terminology, but the principle is this. If you look at a patient before you even do a case, take photos, make sure the patient capture a photo, make sure you have a nice blue screen behind you, take frontal views, side views, do all kinds of things because you want to be able to treatment plan this and know what it is. You're going to treatment plan an FP1 completely different than an FP3. In this case, this patient, you would have never thought of doing an acrylic hybrid uh, bridge because it's not an FP3. So I have this part here and we're going to leave all of the questions for the end. But take a minute and write any of your questions right now and then you can submit them to Michael. All right. Now, we're going to move on to FP2. It says here, Pretal zirconia prosthesis. Most of the FP2s, again, we're replacing tooth, and we're going to replace part of the roots in some of the gingiva. So this is a perfect uh, time to start thinking of doing a zirconia bridge. Another case performed. I happen to think this one was done in Mexico. And what we did, there you can see the multi-unit abutments on the left side. And what's going to happen here is how do we take the vertical dimension? How do we establish centric relation? Very simple. You take your final impression, same technique, open trays, long pins, get a floss, tie them, use Duralay or ugly fluid resins that are just sitting around. Uh, I, I heard someone ask me, well, you know, those resins are gonna contract. Yes, they are, but think about this. You're taking the impression and you're pouring this impression in less than 24 hours. Therefore, if you were to let this resin sit there for a good while, which you're not going to, there would be distortion, but you should be able to get this to your lab and in less than 24 hours, they should be poured. So it's non-consequential to use resins. The shrinkage is not, is not going to make any difference in less than 24 hours. All right, so what we've done here is we taken the master impression and the lab scan the master model. You can see the scan on the right. And it's a complete duplicate of what we have there. We're going to use the same principles as we did before. We're going to fabricate 
a base plate, we're gonna connect it to temporary titanium cylinders and make sure I seen it to where they only use one or two temporary titanium cylinders. That's a mistake. If you have, in this case, I believe we have seven implants. You're gonna place seven titanium cylinders. Your lab is gonna place that rigid base plate and put the wax, the bite rim over it and make sure that you take your impressions. With this, you can ascertain the midline, the interpupillary uh, line. You can see where you are. And therefore, the lab is gonna be able to also scan this solid secure uh, vertical dimension apparatus and you'll be able to duplicate as you see it here. So how do we do this? On the left, you can see the, uh, you have four on, the, on one side and three on the other. Um, and what the lab has done is they take the master model and they take scan bodies. You can see that on the lower part in the middle of your screen. And with the scan bodies, you're able to duplicate this digitally in a perfect way. So now using the same circumstance software, the lab is going to go ahead and plan this digitally from A through C. On the top left side, you can see the structure of where the teeth are gonna be. And then on the top, you can see a little bit, probably three millimeters or so of the root that you are replacing, therefore FP2. On the right side, you can see the porcelain or the zirconia that is gonna go over this frame. And on the bottom, you can see how the bridge is going to look. Now, I'm gonna pose a question to you guys. Have any of you ever done a bridge like this and you send it out or the lab plants it, they send it out to you and now the bridge is, the teeth are too long, too short or the occlusion is not on, on the money and you have to be doing two hours of adjustments and you're grinding away on, on zirconia, which is a nightmare. Um, there's a simple way prosthetically to avoid all of this. And it's this right here. So from this plan on the lower, on the lower side in the middle, I'm going to ask my lab to print a bridge that is a, made out of resin is an inexpensive material. Um, I don't even use PMMAs for this. This, um, this is a lower uh, value or cost of resins, uh, but it has everything that the lab had planned for, the vertical dimension, it has the two shapes, the arrangements, et cetera. And, you can see how I'm delivering in the mouth on the top side of your screen, and I'm screwing all seven screws. Now, don't just try it in with one or two screws. You want to be able to make sure that this goes in passively. If, if it gives you problems going down, then the final bridge is going to give you problems. Then there was a problem with the impression. You shouldn't have a problem if you follow all the protocols that I had dictated before. But this is the most important thing that you can do in order to avoid having to work hours on ends on a final bridge, having to send it back to the lab uh, and having already adjusted the living daylights out of some of the cusp. So I'm going to do all of my adjustments here. I'm going to make the uh, sure that the phonetics are on spot. And the only thing, the only difference between this and the final ones is obviously the aesthetics, but the functions are the same. So the patient should be able to speak, enunciate, he should be able to chew, make him bite, make him do anything that he have to do. If you don't do this and you go directly to the zirconia bridge, you're going to regret it. And you're going to get say, you know what? I went cheap and probably saved $200 for not doing this step. So 
once this was tried, the patient brought in a picture. The patient had a diastema. She looked like a Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, cousin from Mexico. And so it was easy to just be able to give her a diastema. It wasn't hard, but everything else was already done. So you can see there the final bridge. Notice on the lingual, we are replacing some of the tissue that was lost past the cervical. Again, FP2. Uh, notice how all the access holes are lingual and we are able to deliver something that it is aesthetically pleasing to the patient. She loved that diastema. And a lot of times always ask your patients to bring pictures to see how they were when they were young. Sometimes you want to fall over the chair or laugh, but the more you know about your patient's desires, the more you know about their needs, the better off you're going to be able to come out. So this is a full zirconia per tau. When we tried in the bridge, she didn't like the gum being so light. So we ended up uh, using a darker tint for that. All right, so at this moment right here, I would say, Take a minute, write a few questions on the FP2. Do you understand the difference between FP1 and FP2? Now, the prosthetic principles are the same, the steps. Let me just comment, when you're submitting the questions, please don't write in shorthand. You write the complete question and what it's referring to. Otherwise, it's difficult to address them later on. Thank you, Michael. All right, so FP3. Now we're gonna talk about one that is just gonna replace the tooth plus the root and more. So you tend to see this quite a bit with patients, obviously that probably were, this patient was fully edentulous and I don't know for how many years. As a general rule, what you're going to find is that the more bone, the more soft tissue that you have lost, the more implants you need to place. In this case, this patient ended up having uh, eight on the top and eight on the bottom. So a common mistake is planning the case, just thinking about the money. Don't do that. Uh, the money is important and it's a factor. You want to plan the case looking at what type of prosthetic options does your patient has. In other words, if, is the patient an F1, FP2, or FP3? Now, in this case, older lady, 20 some, 30 years using dentures, you're almost for certain gonna know that you're an FP3. Now, what I see here, you see that resin. Uh, at this moment, for some reason, uh, we didn't have the uh, Duralay and uh, we were trying out a, um, a flowable resin that hardens uh, with light and it works like a charm. So uh, on the bottom, you can see part of the floss that was, that was used. Always use the floss, it takes a few minutes. So this is gonna take probably about 10 minutes of your time to do top and bottom, but it's gonna make sure that you have an accurate impression. Without an accurate impression, Everything is downhill. All right. So I know I'm doing basically two screw-on dentures, two hybrids. Um, and you can see on the top left, the bite rims with the marks. You can see uh, the midline. You can see the distal the, of the, um, the middle of the interpropulary line and so forth. So that's also scanned. And you can see, as you, as you see the four images, you can see how the lab is mounting this, okay? One of the things you know that you accomplish this properly is if your models look like they do in the mouth. On the bottom, you see the lab is always gonna plan first for 
the support of the uh, teeth, and then it's going to plan for where the teeth are going to be. Okay, so here we have on the top, we have top and bottom, and we can see the axis holes. This case, remember, the more, the more ideal the case was, an FP1, the more bone, and the simpler your surgery is. FP3s means that you have a lot of bone loss and your implants are not gonna be so ideal. So as you can see here, there's on the top side, on the left model of the maxilla, you have two implants coming out close to the, uh, on the premolars, uh, close to the, uh, the incisal edge. And on the lower, you have three coming out lingually. Now you're saying, uh, you know, how come you couldn't get them like the other ones? Uh, simply because there was so much resorption. When you get to a mandibular arch in the first or second molar areas, a lot of times you have to place the implants where the bone is, knowing that prosthetically you can have solutions to this. Okay, so just be aware that as the diagnosis goes from F1 to F3, now your implant placement is going to be a little less than ideal. On the bottom, you can see uh, we use a different uh, resin for a try-in, but the lab went ahead. I don't go to full bridge here. I don't go to the finals. This is going to be a metal bar with resin teeth. The lab is going to do all of this digitally, but still I want to be able to try in this in the mouth. So I have, you can see the, uh, the papers. Here's a prosto tip for you guys. First, I use the, the Bausch, uh, um, I think 200 microns, the blue one or the horseshoe. And you can see the, uh, the markings there. Once I adjust all of those, then I'm gonna come in with my shim stock. Shim stock is 40 microns. Shim stock is the one that it's, um, I, I don't know if it's aluminum or, or what kind of material it is. It's very thin. Uh, Prostodontists uh, always use them. A lot of general dentists haven't uh, had a chance to, but make a note that you should think of just, rather than just adjusting with the regular blue paper, blue red, or the horseshoe, you should look into shim stock. Once you have adjusted with shim stock, and you're adjusting at 40 microns of space, now you can send this back to the lab. The lab is going to rescan the try-in models, and now it'll make the final uh, prosthesis. When you deliver this prosthesis, whether it's a zirconia pretal or a bar with resin teeth, you're gonna have minimum uh, adjustments and that is beautiful for you. Lab time is phenomenal and it's beautiful for the patients. They don't feel that they paid all this money and now you're adjusting, grinding away their new prosthesis. So this would be your typical FP3 prosthesis. Notice uh, that we have from the tooth to all the way into the gingival area, probably about six or seven millimeters. Okay. So again, uh, I'm giving you time to uh, make your questions according to the section. That way you can, you can say back a hey, uh, Virgil, uh, this one here, what, what do I have to do with this? Okay. So I hope that I have enlightened you. Uh, number one, go back and read, uh, or do it for the first time, Carl Misch, prosthetic classification. And it's easy to find, all right? It was that first chart that I showed you. Uh, and I believe it's in every one of his books on chapter four, if I'm not uh, incorrect, all right? All right, now, can we apply this to, um, to single crowns? Absolutely. Here's a, uh, a case that was done in Nicaragua and uh, my son is a lab tech. He shared it with me yes, uh, the other day. 
and he showed me this. Uh, first of all, what do you see there? We see the CEJs, and then we see probably six or seven millimeters over the CEJ. So that implant it was placed way, way out there. Well, you might say, well, the doctor was an idiot, but it, it's easy to, um, to criticize something when you don't know what happened. I don't know what happened, to be honest. I do know that this is far from ideal case, but if you are the restoring doctor and you get a case where you have had this much bone loss, trauma, uh, several uh, surgeries in the area and nothing has taken, probably you're gonna end up with something like this. Um, when I posted this on the blog, someone said, uh, hey Virgil, why don't you just take it out and graft it? Uh, at this point, if you were to remove this implant, you're gonna destroy the rest of the bone. Good luck trying to graft seven millimeters vertically, okay? So um, here's where the lab comes in and they have to work with you. But again, uh, we knew that this is an FP3 right off the bat. So we informed the patient that this is gonna be a complex case, but there's gonna be a crown with pink porcelain on it, okay? Make sure that you look at that smile uh, line. Make sure, let's see where the lip falls. Uh, in this case, we were lucky because the patient didn't smile too much, probably because he had that ugly tooth there. Uh, and the lab gave me this picture right here. Joshua is showing me how he was screwing the abutment and it was coming in almost at 70 degrees, uh, which is not ideal. So uh, he fabricated a zirconia um, abutment, a custom abutment. That yellow line is gonna uh, show you where the CEJs are. So you can, you can obviously see that's where the crown is gonna come in. So the rest is gonna have to be pink porcelain. All right, this is a look at from, uh, from the top. And again, I don't know, this case was not done by one of my students. Um, this, this was a private case done in Nicaragua by a private doctor. Uh, it just came like that to the lab, but, but it, it shows what an FP3 can be. Uh, I keep saying access hole should be on the lingual. Uh, look at the access hole here. Uh, if anything, you can end up having an access hole on the incisal edge, or maybe the incisal third, or maybe the, uh, the body. But the cervical third, it's, it means that something has gone a little bit uh, not so great. So this is how this was uh, planned on being restored. When you look at it from the top, uh, it looks bulky, yes, but there is no other way to have uh, cover that, uh, that area, that access hole. And that would be uh, how it would be going to be looking in the mouth. Patient didn't allow us to take picture in the mouth, um, but this would be an FP3 for a single crown. If you ever receive a case like this in your office, take an x-ray, look at it, uh, and see how you're gonna, how you're gonna be able to solve it. Uh, you need to explain to your patients, uh, and a lot of times, if you don't, you end up giving them a crown with some pink porcelain, they ain't happy, and now you're not happy. All right, work. We're going to, I'm trying to see how I'm doing with time here. Okay. So we got about 10 more minutes before the hour goes. Okay. I'm going to skip RP4. RP4 means this is a removable, supported completely by implants. Now, just for your information, anyone doing over dentures, whether you're placing two implants, three implants, four implants, the, there are two principles in prosthodontics. And this were established by Earl Pound over a hundred years ago. You have something that is called 
retention. Retention is the ability to lock, let's put it that way, or snap. Clearly, the implants, it doesn't matter how many they are, uh, the implants are what is going to provide retention. Now, when it comes to stability, that's going to come from the soft tissues. And in the soft tissues, we know that that's going to be on the mylohyo ridge and on the retromolar pad on the lower, on the tuberosity on the upper, and part of the heart palate on the upper. So why am I skipping RP4? Because in an RP4, you need to have enough implants to support a removable prosthesis and it's held on 100% just by implants. But think about this. This means that I would have to place probably five or six implants in order to have a removable prosthesis. So the question kind of becomes, why would I have a removable prosthesis if I have enough implants? Uh, it used to be common uh, in my days to do this, we used to do a lot of uh, mill bars and we would have uh, a denture with substructures that would lock onto the mill bars. We're not doing that too much. Nowadays, almost everyone is doing either the fixed bridges, any of the three that I showed before, or they're going to an FP5, which means that the retention is gonna come from the implant but the support is still going to come from the soft tissues. I'm going to pose a question for you guys. See what opinions you guys have. When I was in dental school many moons ago, we were taught, well, back then, to be honest, there was no um, implant classes. Uh, but during those days, they were talking about having to do over dentures, placing two implants on the canines. And they used to use uh, uh, O-balls. They used to use uh, uh, ERAs. I, I don't believe that they, they exist anymore. Uh, and now, now they're using locators or any of the uh, locators uh, uh, compatible systems. So I have a problem with this. If you place two implants, this imagine this denture is going to go in. What's going to happen when the patient chews? It's going to lift from the back. So now you have a patient who you operated, placed two implants. You promised to have a very retentive denture, which it is, but it's not stable. The stability is not there. Okay. So with time, people started saying, well, let's place more implants. Rather than placing two implants, they started placing fours. In this, I would say today is probably the most common uh, modality. I personally believe that it's a mistake and I'll explain why. So when you place four, the retention increases. Yes. Now, I guarantee you many of you have restored an overdenture with four and it is so darn tight and retentive that you end up not putting one of them uh, to use. You end up with three, okay? I know it's happened to me. My problem with this, and when you do this, the denture no longer rocks from the back, but now you have a problem, is that the more implants you add to a system in an overdenture, the more weak the acrylic becomes. And therefore, you start having breakage. In the middle of the denture is very common or in between implants. So here I can illustrate what's happening. Acrylic, let's go back to basic implantology. In basic implantology, you need one millimeter all the way around an implant for bone to osseointegrate. Therefore, if you have two implants next to each other, you need a, a minimum of three millimeters of space 
for bone to integrate. We know this. Acrylic is a different animal. It's very jealous. It wants a space. It demands a space. Acrylic wants to have five millimeters of room, mesial distal, sideways, and upward. So if you don't have five millimeters, so now if you have two implants next to each other, in acrylic, you need to have five millimeters of acrylic around it. Therefore, in between implants, you should have 10 millimeters of space. If not, this denture will fracture unless you use um, a mesh. I'm not a fan of mesh. Some people are, and it's okay. But if you don't want to be using mesh, and you don't have to, in the case that you're looking right there, it's going to have three weak points because there's not enough space for the acrylic not to break. And that, this is the number one reason. If any of you are keep having fractures after fractures, because you don't have 10 millimeters between implants. So my solution about five years ago was to say, well, guys, let's do this. Um, five years ago, I was uh, fortunate to train a group of DSO called Affordable Dentures, and they needed to find a solution for this common problem. So what I suggested was to place three. We call it the ML3, Mongalo Lower on three. <coughs> Excuse me. All it is, I don't place implants on the canines. I open a flap, I reflect the foramen, and I place my implants seven millimeters anterior to the foramen. So usually those distal implants end up being around the first premolar. And then I place one in the midline. Now, as you can see, now we're going to have 10 millimeters space easily or more between implants. If we go back here, right here, the implants you're looking at there, it doesn't matter what brand they are, um, let's say they're four millimeters. So in between them, you're going to have probably about six millimeters in, in another one, seven, and the other one about five. They're prone to fracture. Here, if the implants here, let's assume that they're four millimeters, you don't need a measurement to see that the space there is about 12 millimeters. Therefore, you can fabricate an overdenture that will not fracture, and you don't, do not need to add a mesh. Uh, we proved that I ended up training over a period of three years, 240 doctors from affordable dentures. And this is the method that they use. If you look on the website and you look under affordables, you'll see part of their advertisement, they show a picture with three implants. Uh, it's of great service to the patient and you don't have to be uh, repairing broken uh, bases. Same thing, this is just uh, showing you exactly the same thing. Now. The advantage of three over two is clearly because if you have two, you're not gonna have, you're gonna rotate from the back. When you have three, when it wants to rotate from the back, it'll hit the middle implant and it's going to act as an anti-rotational device. And when it does this, it's gonna go ahead and prevent it from rotating. So if you're thinking of doing an overdenture on the bottom, think of the ML3. All right. Now, uh, here's a very cool, very simple way of taking an impression. We were talking about doing an impression with um, for fixed bridges. Now for dentures, you've done everything right. You did your surgery, you planned it nice. Now you need to fabricate an overdenture. Most of us are not great at doing dentures. Unless you're a lab tech or you have lab tech training, then you have some problems with this. So a very simple solution is called Massad technique, M-A-S-S-A-D. 
Joseph Massad is a Greek dentist that teaches here in the United States and is considered one of the best prosthodontists, removable prosthodontists in the United States. He came up with this technique. Very simple. Take a plastic, not a metal, um, tray. And in this case, we're taking obviously the impression of the lower. You're going to add three dots, one for the anteriors and two for the uh, molar area. If you were taking impression of the maxilla, you would add a dot in the palate. So when this comes out, what you have is, as you can see, you have centric stops. What, what is the importance of centric stops? I, I go back to uh, my, my good old days in, in, in dental school where the, the professors used to make us put centric stop with this little uh, red waxes. I, I never got it. And when they used to talk about the material has to be uh, evenly and have two millimeters, I, I never got it. But now, now I get it a little bit late. All it is, is two things. If you have centric stops like here, you can see where the molar retromolar sites are starting to mark in the anteriors. When you sit this tray, it's going to basically sit in three spots. So the next part of the equation is going to be taking, this is a heavy body uh, PBS. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill all the spaces, but also come around and mark all of the uh, flanges. So I'm going to go ahead and take this and sit it in there. If it's on the lower, think how many times you've taken an impression, a final impression with PBS and it comes out horrible because it's moving like a canoe. It's horrible. Now, if you create it, centric stops, then it wouldn't move. It stops uh, the movement and you're able to record the uh, border moldings much better. So, as you can see here, look at the outer parts of the tray. They're trimmed. Let's go back here. The tray was intact there. What did I do? When the impression came out, if you're able to see any part of the impression uh, of the tray protruding through the impression, it means you're going to have a high spot. So what I tend to do is I tend to cut all of the uh, borders that are protruding there. And that's why you're seeing that the tray has been cut. And now I'm gonna use a PBS wash. I'm gonna paint it. Uh, by painting it means I'm gonna inject the middle of the tray like I'm doing there. And then I'm gonna take uh, a brush or, or any kind of instrument, a spatula, and just gonna run it all over uh, all the areas. You do your border molding. And now you can see how you capture all the areas that you need to capture for uh, an overdenture. All right. Uh, I'm going to stop there. So this is me. And I uh, haven't been able to get a, uh, you can see there, lots of white hair. I haven't been able to go to the barber due to Corona. Um, I'm at your service. Uh, I've been working and teaching with uh, Blue Sky Bio for uh, half a decade now. So far, we have placed close to 42,000 Blue Sky uh, Bio implants, and we have a great success rate over 96.5%, which is phenomenal. Uh, hopefully, when this is over, I'm at your service. Uh, my phone number is there, and uh, I pick up my calls, and you can talk to me about anything that you need in uh in implant dentistry uh thank you for your time okay so before we get into the questions if somebody wanted to attend one of your courses uh, in the future where could they see information about your upcoming courses yes uh the website is live l-i-v-e implants plural dot com so you go there in liveimplants.com 
we have five different courses. They're all, all of these courses have a component of patience with them. Um, your guarantee, if you're a beginner, you've never taken a course, never placed an implant. We love those uh, doctors because it's like painting on, the, on a white canvas. Uh, you don't have bad habits. Um, if you're a beginner, you're gonna come in and in a week, you're gonna place anywhere from 25 to 30 implants on patients. Um, if you're advanced, you can come in, there's courses for uh, lateral windows. And if you're super advanced, you're gonna come in for uh, full arch immediate loading uh, surgeries. Okay, and your blog, where can your blog be found? Oh, you know what? Um, what the blog is, uh, we have over a thousand doctors in there. You don't have to be one of my students to be in the blog. Um, you have to have WhatsApp. What I'll do is if someone sends me to this number, sends me the, their name and their, their cell number, I'm not going to be bothering you. I'm not going to contact you. Uh, but I will add you to the blog. Just say, add me to your blog. We post cases uh, on a daily basis, at least two or three. Uh, since we have... Uh, we have a lot of, uh, we do, we place about 350 implants per course every month. Uh, we have, I have plenty of all of these cases uh, to share with you guys. And, and it, it's a great thing to, uh, to be looking at uh, education in the time of Corona when you're not, when you're not working in your office. Okay, very good. Do you see that there's the button for q and It's either in your the toolbar top or the bottom of your screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so go ahead and click on Q&A and you'll be able to see the questions that came in. All right. Could, do uh, I do I type the answer or do I, do I read them out? You could just speak the answer and then if you move your mouse to the top of the question, the top right of the question, there's a X box. So after you answer the question, you could click the dismiss X and then the right. question will disappear. All right, so uh, Dr. Stefan uh, wrote, presume using guided surgery would be the preference in most cases. Uh, Stefan, I would wanna tell you, uh, as much as I love computer guided, um, sometimes uh, you're gonna have to do some freehanded. Uh, what I would say is I would wanna plan every single case with a CT scan, use the Blue Sky Bio plan, uh, probably uh, you know that it's free, uh, plan this case. And sometimes there is a need to do some bone graftings, uh, a need to do other type of adjunctive procedures. Um, and therefore a surgical guide might not be the answer. For, uh, for straightforward cases, a lot of the partially edentulous, I would almost go 100% of the times um, with computer guided. So, so my answer, it really depends on the type of case. Uh, to think that you're gonna do everything computer guided, I don't know. Uh, Michael, do you know of anybody doing everything 100% computer guided? I'm not sure, but you know, I do wanna comment actually that tomorrow, Dr. Michael Scherer is gonna be planning cases live in his webinar and we're accepting cases for planning. So if you have a case and you want help planning or you wanna see how a different dentist would approach the case. You could send me the case, msaltzman at blueskybio.com. That's M-S-A-L-T-Z-M-A-N at blueskybio.com. And we could hopefully treatment plan some of those cases live. But uh, responding, I'm not sure if I know of dentists that are doing 100% of their cases guided. Although with the price today, you know, it's much more affordable and the turnaround you could do it in your own clinic. It's it's much more manageable than in the past. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's go to, uh, Stefan has another question. If full arch surgery fully guided would become more beneficial given the ability to be able to plan the surgical prosthetic both provisionals and finals? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, if you have uh, a, a fully guided we're talking, they can be two types of fully guided, obviously. If we are doing mucosal supported, 
uh, fully guided. Uh, it means that you're not going to have to reduce, do any type of abiloplasty. And again, this goes back to planning the cases in the prosthetic classification that I showed you. Uh, if that is the case, you go fully guided, mucus to support it, and it's done. Now, if the case, you ha have to end up doing bone reduction, you can still do it guided, but now you're gonna have, have to open a flap. And uh, I'm sure that in, in one of these uh, webinars, they're gonna teach you what they're doing as far as how to plan this, because that's a little more complex. Uh, all right, let's see, let's go to the next one. Dr. Hanna, uh, what's the name of the blog? It is called, by the way, the blog is, it's 100% uh, critic free. In other words, if you post something, it's called LIT, it stands for live implant training, surgery four. Uh, WhatsApp allows you to have, I think, close to 300 in uh, where I'm group number, we're finishing group number four. So as soon as we uh, were done with the capacity, we'll open LI35. Um, so it's a critic free so if you post a question, it doesn't matter how silly, uh, there's no stupid questions, um, we'll answer it. This is not Dental Town where I have posted a case in Dental Town that I thought it was beautiful and I got cru crucified. Uh, I think I went home and cried that day. Um, so I stopped uh, and, and I have a thick skin. I mean, I've done over 20,000 implants. Uh, so I wanna think I kind of know what I'm doing. Uh, there's some blogs that are, that are nice, but they're, uh, there's, there's what I call haters or, or guys that just want to uh, put their two sentences and make you feel bad. Uh, that's not going to happen in this blog. And if you don't want to post anything, just, just enjoy and read the cases that we're posting. But, but you do need uh, to have uh, a WhatsApp number. It, all it is is your, the same cell number that you have go on WhatsApp and uh, you download it for free. You don't have to change your number. And from there, I'm gonna add you to it. All right, let's see. Stefan again, if you're doing full arch free-handed, I presume you have been working on some guides based on the prosthetic plan. Yes, uh, nowadays, any full arch, you gotta be having, you, you gotta plan it on 3Ds. Uh, it would be silly not to. Uh, by the time a patient is doing a full arch, you're going to be placing a minimum three all the way up to eight or whatever. Um, you're talking, these cases are in the thousands. Uh, it, it's, it, you have to take a CT scan. You have to plan it properly. Uh, you have to learn also. It's not just taking the, uh, taking the scan is part of it. You have to know, you should know the protocols on how to do scannings for fully edentulous. Because if you take a scan, uh, a scan is gonna show you the amount of bone, but it doesn't show you where uh, the implants are gonna come out prosthetically. For that, you need to have a scanning prosthesis. Uh, do you have such a, uh, a webinar, uh, Michael? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have um... Okay, all right, great. So. Let's see, if we have another one from Stefan says, would you agree that fixed would be better option in most cases in terms of biological failures and maintenance? Not necessarily. Uh, it really depends on the amount of bone loss. Sometimes the amount of bone loss, it is so great. This is where a uh, removable prosthesis actually might be better. Um, some patients have an issue uh, in that not everybody wants a fixed bridge. I know that sounds strange, but uh, I, I get patients with money and with no money. And there's no accounting for what patients want. So please talk to your patients and, and show them the options. Um, I, I love to do fixed bridges, but I also love to do uh, uh, RPs, uh, fives, I think the great service. 
it really depends on what the patient needs. Uh, don't go on your needs. Don't be based on, on your needs. Be based on the patient's needs. And, and if you understand that, you'll be able to give them what they want. All right, Dr. Ali, uh, when do you call it hybrid? Okay, a hybrid is a fixed, exclude, retain, removable prosthesis. In other words, it's a fixed bridge that has access holes and that you can remove it. As opposed to having cemented, noted, notice that I didn't show any cases cemented. Uh, I think that 95% of everything that I do is screw retain. Um, and hybrid just represents, it's a combination of fixed with removable. It's fixed for the patients, it's removable because the doctors can do it. Um, Okay, Stefan, uh, are you concerned with the vertical cantilevers in cases of FP3? Cases presume you maximize AP spread to ensure decreased horizontal cantilevers. Okay, um, in order to, uh, very good question, Stefan, I like this. In order to minimize the cantilevers, this is where proper planning and placing implants posteriorly as far as possible uh, allows you, uh, is necessary. So yes, I, I like to minimize uh, cantilevers as much as possible. If you saw from my presentations, uh, you don't see two or three molars, uh, two or three teeth just hanging from uh, the most distal implant. Um, that comes uh, with looking at the scans and having the ability to, if you need to place an implant in the molars, uh, being able to do uh, bone graft, sinus lift. All right, Stefan, why so many implants in the anterior case? Okay, so think about this. A patient lost uh, uh, seven teeth in the anterior. The bone was perfect. Uh, and I presented to the patient the case we wanted to do. And uh, we were able to, uh, the patient agreed uh, on the treatment plan. That, that's going to be a case that it's gonna be trouble-free for many years to come. Uh, the less implants you start placing, the more stress you're gonna place on the prosthesis. So uh, I really don't have an issue placing uh, as many implants as I can. Uh, the more implants, you always wanna over-engineer, Stephanie. Dustin, what's up, Dr. Mongalo? Dustin Guadalajara. <laughs> hey man, good to talk to you. Uh, I hope you enjoy the, uh, uh, the webinar. Uh, this, uh, three of those cases are gonna come out in the book. Uh, uh, I hope to, uh, to be able to post it on the uh, Blue Sky Bio website once we have it out. Uh, not only is it it's gonna be uh, informative, it's very artistic. We hire two uh, dental professional photographers and they've done some beautiful stuff. Uh, hey. Good to talk to you, Dustin. All right, Stefan W. I don't know what that means. Stefan, would you consider taking an impression at the time of surgery rather than at the healing? You know what? Some doctors are doing it. I know uh, Tischler does it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of that uh, because tissues are going to change. So some doctors have a great... Uh, result with it, I can't say uh, that I would do it myself. So what I do, uh, if you ever uh, get my book, hopefully, you're going to see that uh, I do immediate loading. More, more than half of the cases that I do are immediate loading. Uh, but when it comes to final, I always do my impressions once the tissues have uh, healed completely. At the time of surgery, would it not be more sensible to have a digital copy of the final restoration at the time of placement, giving the positions of the implants in relations to the final restorations while giving virtual verification jig? Um, again, I think I just answered this. Um, what I do is when I do uh, full arch immediate loading, I pre-plan everything. Uh, when we do our surgeries, we take impressions right there and then we scan them and we do our immediate PMMAs right there in less than 24 hours. Yet, 
uh, four or six months later, I come back. Then when the tissues are completely healed, I like to place my scan bodies and scan this, take it, send it to the lab and let them do their magics. To me, it is much more um, predictable. Stefan, would you make it provisional for this to develop the tissues? Uh, I just answer this. Yes, with immediate loading, absolutely. In my book, I have a chapter just on um, immediate PMMAs, uh, which are phenomenal for, uh, for provisionals. Monica, can you see the use of multi-unit abutments for anterior crowns uh, on implants? I have done it. A problem with the anteriors, especially if you're on FP1, is that they're going to steal some of that room that you, that you really need in order to get the beautiful aesthetics. Now, uh, so for anterior crowns, I tend to just go directly to the implant. Uh, in order to achieve that, I have, to, uh, I have to be able to make sure that I place my implants uh, lingually. All right. Monica, can you show a picture of a multi-unit abutment? Uh, I don't know how, how to go back on this. Let me see. Uh, Monica, I don't know how to go back here. Uh, if you go on um, blueskybio.com, um, go on Biomax, click there, and it's going to say prosthetics. When you go to prosthetics, there's going to be three can several Scroll down, it's going to have impression posts, analogs, and then it's going to have multi-units. Uh, click there, and you can see what a multi-unit looks like. And a multi-unit simply allows you, this is a sign for multiple, uh, for prosthetics with multiple implants, where you have to be doing uh, correction of angles. And at the same time, uh, where you're able to plan prosthetically a little bit better than if you were coming right off the implant. Stefan, when doing an FP1 like this, would you consider a CT graph to thicken tissues before progressing? Okay, if you're doing an FP1, you don't need to do grafting. FP1 means that there is no loss of tissues. Okay, that would be, you would do that for FP1 probably for FP3s. Larson, J I mean, Jason, do you recommend reinforcing FP1 temps? Uh, yes, very good question, yes. Uh, what I do is, um, in my book I show the, uh, the PMMAs that I have, we either design them thicker or the lab uh, incorporates a little, uh, uh, a, little, a little metal to it. Rinuka, can you please share again the FP classification slide at the end? Uh, you know what? I'm, I, I don't know how to go back. I don't know if I can. Am I, am I able to go back, Michael? I don't you know. Could, you could close the presentation and bring it up again. Um, and, and, then go, and then go back to the answers? Yeah. Okay. No, so keep that open. Don't close that. Okay. Don't close that. Just click on your presentation. Okay, let me see. Oops. All right, I got lost here. Uh -huh. Okay, you know, maybe we'll deal with this at the end. And Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you what. Yeah, let's, let's get out of there. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. So... These are, let's see, how do I go back here? Yeah, click share. Yeah, there you go. Okay, now we see it. Just see move. It? Okay. Yeah. So uh, to go back, uh, this is what you want to read. It actually says here, Coromish bone classification. It was published on Dentistry Today on 1989. I do know that it's also in chapter four of his book. I think all of his books, uh, the different editions, they all have them. Um, this is what we were we've been talking about. 
So as you can see, FP1, there's no need for graftings of any kind. The other ones, yes. All right, so let's go up here. Let's go to Q and A. All right, so I hope you, you, you caught it there. If not, uh, if you guys are in my blog, I'm gonna post some of this. Uh, I'll post this presentation on the blog. Okay, so let's see. Stefan, um, why can't you do this beforehand if you already have this sign, the final prosthesis, so you know the position of the vertical dimension. Presume with a case like this, this protected guard is made due to where present. Um, I, I think I shown uh, how we plan every single case, uh, but somehow I, I think I, I, I get the feeling that you wanna be able to go to finals uh, at the time of surgery. Uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if, you, if that is your route, go train with Michael Tischler uh, because he does that. Um, I've, I have tried that in the past and uh, I have to go back to a, uh, to a more predictable way which is doing the surgeries that I'm, that I'm doing um, and then doing the finals right at the end. Okay, Gupta, what is the alternative to resin if we're using uh, outstation lab, keeping in mind the shipping time um, to resin? Um, uh, are we talking about uh, the FP3 where, where uh, we're talking about the hybrid with the resin teeth, or are we talking about the uh, the try-in uh, resin? I think you're probably talking about that one. Um, I, I would have to tell you, if if you skip this step, Gupta, and you go directly to the final, and I understand sometimes you're, you're dealing with the lab back and forth, especially uh, out of the States, uh, it might be a uh, it might be difficult, uh, you will regret it. Uh, the lab probably sent seven times out of 10 will get it on the money and you don't have to do much adjustments. But those three times out of 10, you're gonna hate yourself for not having gone with a uh, recent try-in. Stefan, how do you control the timing if it's not done fully guided? Simple, Stefan, experience. It, it's that simple. Uh, the more you do, uh, the better you get. Uh, I can do, I can open a flap and play six or eight implants and suture in probably less than an hour. Um, you're a beginner, you probably is going to take you anywhere from three to four hours, like everything else. When you came out of dental school, prepping a crown took you forever. 20 years into practice, you can probably prep uh, a, a crown in, in 10 minutes. Stefan, no, because I tried the final prosthesis before. Okay, so good for you. If that works for you, you stick with whatever works for you, Stefan. Um, I, I stick with what has worked for me. Uh, and I try to teach things that are, uh, that have been good in my hands and that we've seen so much. Like I said, uh, we have done about 120 courses, which means we have placed in the courses over 50,000 implants and we're seeing what's, what's more predictable than not. But if whatever works for you, that's what you stick with. William, what is your favorite way to determine F cave type in the case of fully edential? William, uh, I wanna send you a kiss because this is a question I was looking for. Um, that means you've been paying attention. Look. Uh, it's simple. So a patient comes in with dentures. The first thing you want to do is you want to go ahead, take new impressions, forget about those dentures. Before you even do the case, take new impressions and then request the lab uh, to, you do all the try-ins and everything. With the exception, you're going to do uh, the try-ins without flanges on the anteriors, top and bottom. And that's going to be able to show you uh, FP1, 2, or 3. If you have a denture top and bottom with no flanges top and bottom, and 
and the teeth are normal and you have and, and they're good, there's no space, then you're FB1. But uh, if if you need the, the space for the flange and, and there's a gap there, you're gonna be looking at an FP3. In other words, make sure that you make you start from scratch, take your massage impression technique, uh, do and when you get to the trying stage, just do canine to canine. I mean, do all the teeth, but canine to canine, top and bottom, with no flanges. Very good question. Thank you. Okay, admit, isn't the prosthetic screw for the full for the multi-unit abutments for one-time use? Do you replace the screws after the trying? Well, good question. What I do is I have a bunch of screws laying there for the tryings. And then when I go to do the finals, I just put new screws. So when you're starting to do this, let's assume that you're doing at least one or two cases a month, which means you have a booming practice. You're probably placing 40 implants. You should have a tackle box with a bunch of screws and I call them lab screws. So all of my tryings, they go in with that screw and they stay in that box and then I'll reuse those. Okay, you know, you, you can re-sterilize them. For the final prosthetics, I just put on new screws and, and then I, I don't touch them anymore. Okay, Stefan, this has quite a big horizontal cantilever on both sides. I don't know which one you're looking at. Um, hmm, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see your screen. The questions are blocking. Oh, okay, but it's still the, the, the cantilever here, you got seven implants. We got one molar being cantilever. That's not a big cantilever on both sides. Let's see the other one. This one here has no cantilevers. So I don't know. I'm not being argumentative, Stefan, but I don't know what you're looking at. Uh, this one has one molar on each side. That is completely within uh, the realms of AP spreads. Okay, Taner. Oh, you're there, big man. Uh, you're in Canada, right? Which type of occlusion you prefer to adjust in, on that kind of prostate? I like to do bilateral balance occlusion. Stephen, what occlusion scheme? I just answer it. Travis, can you show any examples of your base place that you can use for the bite registration? I don't have them here. Um, I actually have a, a part in my book. Uh, you know, all it is is this, ask your lab to, uh, to put temporary titanium cylinders on top of the uh, multi-units. And then they'll put a base plate, uh, they'll, they'll cure it or tie it, however it is that they do it, and put the uh, bite rims on top of it. So you're gonna have, it's like a bite block, but with a bunch of holes with screws. Gupta, this is regarding using acrylic along with floss connecting multiple impression poles while making impressions, FP2s. Okay, all it is, uh, it's, um, in the old days we used to put Duralay, but Duralay tends to kind of uh, drop and, and it's kind of messy. Uh, same thing with resins. So taking the floss, you just floss them everywhere as much as you can, like, like I showed you, uh, I think I have it here. Um, See, so you floss this everywhere right here and you tie it in a couple places. All it does, it allows you for the resin or the Duralay uh, to flow in there and not to slouch everywhere. John, please review FP2 bite registration. Let me see. Okay. Uh, again, I, ha I have the uh, questions in the middle, but that's okay. I think we can see this, see this here. Um, I think this one is better. I can show you it here. You just take those bite rims, just like I, I answered to Dr. Gupta. Take your bite, 
do your midline, do your interpupillary line, uh, do your smile lines, okay? So you're taking your bite uh, just like you would with dentures, except they're being screwed on, okay? And then once you establish all of this, the lab is gonna take this and, um, and design the rest digitally. Okay, Dr. Mitu, do you prefer a screw retain or abutment cement restorations? Um, I answer that. Very rarely do I ever uh, cement. Um, I've been doing this a long time and I there was a time where I did full arches, cementable and they were beautiful. There was no holes in there. And I ended up having a problem with one of them and having to remove that uh, was a bear. I ended up cutting the bridge. It was a night nightmare. Ever since then, uh, I see no reason why to go uh, cementable, even with single crowns. Uh, do yourself a favor, go screw retain. Any issues, you just unscrew that, try it in and you're done. Don't complicate your life. Dr. Shah, how about hygiene and FP3? Okay, in the old days, Dr. Brennan Mark advocated to do what is called high water bridge or the Montreal bridge. The Canadians took over this, of course. Um, and what it was, you left two to three millimeters of space. Well, you know what? Phonetic goes out the window. People are whistling, uh, and food is coming in and out. And on the bottom is just a nightmare. Um, again, I, I'm old enough to have done those. Eventually we ended up doing about a millimeter hygienic Patients hated it, especially in the maxilla. So what we learned to do the, is we go as close as we can to the tissues. Uh, we try not to do rich laps. Uh, sometimes uh, we end up doing a little bit, even though it's not ideal. And with these patients, uh, I have an honor system. They come every three months. I unscrew the prosthesis. I send them, uh, you know, you bioclean them and you're able to check the tissues. If the tissues are pink and nice, then you put them on a six month recall. If the tissues are red, then you're gonna adjust them. And that's with FP3s and having um, acrylic, you're able to do that. Very good question. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Philip, can you please give us an idea how the patient can maintain hygiene under the prosthesis? Um, what I do with this case is, like I said, uh, I don't let my patients, you basically marry to these patients. You know, these people are paying you twenty to $40,000. Uh, better believe it, uh, it's like a car. They're going to be at, at the repair shop quite a bit. In order to avoid um, having them upset with you, I make them come every three months. I remove the bridges. I check the soft tissues. I take x-rays, I check the occlusions, and believe me, I catch so many little things. If a screw, it, it's not, it's giving me problems, I replace it, and they pay minimal for this. So they're happy because uh, they're able to maintain this, and when you do this, you see little, little bone loss. If you do not see your patients this often, and I insist that they do, um, then you put it on them. Javier, do you ever consider doing premolar occlusion on FP3s? Yes, yes, sometimes I do, sir. Uh, especially on an all on four. Richard, after the mill resin prosthesis is adjusted, do you 3D scan or send the physically prosthesis back to the lab? What do you send to the patient home with? Okay, remember, patients have. Um, all of these patients, well, I didn't get into that, but all of these patients have, uh, I did immediate loading. So they have a, uh, a temporary uh, prosthesis. Uh, fortunately for me, my lab is it's in my office. So I give it to them and uh, they scan them. Uh, I would send, I would physically send it to the lab uh, so they can rescan the whole prosthesis. Me too. How do you plan? How do you plan the junction prosthetic line and FP3 not to be visible in smile line? Well, 
the fact that you have an FP3 means already that the smile line, it, that's not an issue because uh, that's going to be, if, if it was right at the smile line, it would probably be either uh, an FP1 or maybe an FP2. I, I don't know if, if, if you understand that part. Um, read the article and, and you're going to understand what I'm talking about. With FP3s, that smile line is always way up. I mean, the, uh, the junction is way up there. Uh, with some of these cases that you're doing all on fours or teeth in a day or whatever, and you're plasting the bone, uh, by the time you end up doing that, uh, your, that junction is never seen. George, can you repeat and spell the occlusion paper micron? Okay, it's, it's called Shimstock. Uh, go in any any of your um, distributors. Uh, Henry Shine should have a shim stock. I don't know how to spell shim stock. Let me see. Uh, right off the top top of my head, I think is S C H I M stock. Um, it's it's the most wonderful thing in the world. A lot of times you do your adjustments with a bouch, uh, two hundred microns, which is the blue paper. And then you think you've done good and the lab comes back and you're still adjusting. That's because you didn't use the shim stock. That's a prostal uh, secret from, uh, uh, from my father. Daniel, hey Daniel, how are you, man? What about using scan bodies to digitally scan an impression? Hacker it is. Um, absolutely. Uh, right on the money, they're, they're uh, scan bodies are, are, are the best. So I don't know if that answers your question. It is completely accurate. David, do you use multi units for your FP1 to make your bridge? Okay, no. FP1 means uh, you're only replacing teeth. Um, so if you're placing a multi unit, you're going to steal the space for the teeth. Now you're going to end up making it higher. So you wouldn't use it. Um, do you use multiple non-index abutments to make your bridge? Okay. When doing a bridge, like as in the case that I did, I use uh, uh, non, non-engaging hex uh, uh, abutments. Okay. All right. Do you, take, uh, do you take shape for your soft tissue? Yes, that, that comes with the impression, which can be digital or can, uh, can be uh, physical. Uh, Escobar, in FP3 case, on the digital case, it shows that the occlusal plane look canted. Huh, let me see. You might have caught something that I didn't. Let me see here. Okay. I don't know what you caught. Um, probably have better eyes than I did. Um, No, no, and that's a beautiful thing with the, with this digital uh, uh, ExoCAD programs and you're able to design the curve of speed and everything else. Uh, I, I don't I don't see it. Okay, let's see. Uh, how can you assess after the registration is already scanned and confirm on patient the mouth that it looks canted on the digital scan? Will it affect the final product? If you catch that it's canted on the uh, on there. I would go back and redo it in the mouth and then rescan it. Stefan, lots of maintenance with implant retain implant dentures. Implant retain implant dentures. Okay, that, that's okay. That's that's a wrong word usage of word. Uh, a denture is it's uh, is implant slash soft tissue uh, prosthesis supported especially when using bowls. This is an implant retained, uh, not an implant supported. It could be, you agree, the new generation sex locator. Um, you know what? Um, some people love the sex locators. Um, I haven't tried them. I, I, I stopped using locators a few years back. Blue Sky Bio, my problem with the locators were that uh, the, um, the attachments, the female parts were run out 
uh, wear out pretty fast and then you have to replace them. Uh, with the ones from Blue Sky Bio, uh, I haven't had that issue. I don't have to replace them for uh, in less than a year. Uh, I don't know what type of technology um, they have, uh, but uh, says locators, I hear good things. Again, if that's what you like, Stefan, uh, you stick to that. Admit, place an implant in the lower midline. Any issues with the mandibular lingual canal? Um, if if you are a novice, I can see why why you would be uh, concerned with this. Uh, if you, if you are advanced doctor, by advanced you place more than three hundred implants, uh, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, the, uh, the the lingual canal actually when that's a misnomer. Uh, what you're concerned about is the um, myelohyoid, uh, not a myelohyoid, the um, the genial fossa because the genial tubercles because you have a lot of vascularization there, um, and yes, you have uh, the lingual artery that you can see on the, on the middle of the scan. When you take the scan, you can trace it. If 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 usually it's way down there, uh, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, with some of my students that are not that proficient with surgeries and they're very concerned with it, I tell them just to go to the midline. And, and that makes them feel better and, and it solves the problem. The important thing, whether it's the lateral or the midline, is that you have a third implant that gives you anti-rotational. Uh, but, but good question, Ahmed. Uh, I would, if I were you and, and, I, and I don't, I don't want to make you uncomfortable, uh, just place it on the lateral. It gets the same results. Michael, when you place three implants, how is the AP spread affected? Oh, it's beautiful. Take a look right here. Um, in this slide right here, too bad this is in the middle. The red is the, uh, the posterior and the green is the anterior. Because I place my implants close to the premolar, I have a great AP spread better than if I did four. With four, I, my AP spread is almost, it's not as great. With three, I'm able to uh, space this farther back. And being able, one of the things that I teach is to reflect the foramen uh, and place the implant seven millimeters anterior. So we're not placing the implants in the canines. We're in the premolar site. That, that's a good question. Michael. How far back can you cantilever? Well, remember, uh, this is overdentures. Uh, in reality, with overdentures, you're not cantilevering because the retromolar pad in the Milohio fossa are your load bearing areas uh, on that denture. So this is not cantilevering. We're talking about uh, RP5, okay, for overdentures. Amanda. Are you using a light body PBS for wash impression? Yes. Dr. Hong, can you repeat the website, please? Yes. Live, L-I-V-E, implants, I-M-P, I-M-P-L, I had a brain uh, part there for a second. Let me start again, sorry. L-I-V, L, Live, L-I-V-E, I-M-P-L-A-I-A-N-T-S dot com. Liveimplants dot com. Or you can go, you know what, if you're on, I hope you, you're on the blog, um, I'll, send, I'll send the information because I'm going to post it in a bit. Liveimplants dot com. I wrote the information, the websites uh, to everybody on chat. So you can look in chat and all the URLs are there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, Miguel, uh, you mentioned the ML3 method of mandibular overdentures. Does it not work with the maxillary? No. Uh, because in the maxillary, it would mean you would place it in the uh, incisive foramen. Uh, not, uh, no, in the incisive papilla, which obviously you're not going to. In the maxilla is two on the premolars and two on the laterals. And that's conventional. But when you do two premolars and two laterals, you still have your 10 millimeters. What I was trying to get at is I need to get away from uh, not having 
10 millimeters between implants for overdentures. Most people fail to know that. Uh, Nasrin, FP3, how do the patient will be able to clean under the prosthesis? Um, you, what you get, get them to use a water pick and just water pick underneath it. Uh, an electric toothbrush as much as you can. And believe it or not, they're pretty good. You're not doing this ridge that are two or three millimeters over the ridge. I mean, usually you're doing it probably half a millimeter to one millimeter. So they're able, they're able to clean in there. But the most important thing comes from you bringing them back every three months. And some patients keep their tissue so beautiful that I have no concerns. Uh, some patients, uh, they don't take care of their, their tissues. And, and I get on their cases, I insist that, that they're going to end up losing implants. And, I, and at that point, it gives me the freedom to, uh, to go more towards a hygienic uh, bridge, which they all hate. So uh, it, it's about patient management also. Renuka, I have not placed implants before. Can you suggest how I can prepare before I take your course? What procedures and study materials? Very simple. If you send me your, um, your contact, um, what I'm going to do, I, need, I, I just need the WhatsApp number. Um, I'm going to send uh, a link to my, um, to my book. It's the first book that I wrote. Uh, that's the book that we use to train all the doctors. It's 170 pages of illustrations. So if you're going to do a lot of, not a lot of window, a sinus lift, it shows you four different types of sinus lift and it shows you step-by-step step how to do them. Uh, not that you're going to come after reading a book and do it, but that's how we prepare our doctors. So just make sure you're, you're in WhatsApp. Send me that, whoever sends me the WhatsApp, uh, I'm going to send them an invitation uh, and you'll be there and I'll send a link to uh, all of you guys. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Darji, uh, what can affect gingival, gingival when applying FP2? What can affect? I don't know the question. What can affect gingival? I don't know. And I kind of I got I got lost with that question. Um, you're not you're not replacing too much gingival with FP2s. You're doing it with FP3s. Um, uh, try to re rephrase your question so I can better understand you, Doc. Stefan, I agree. Uh, you have to be able to go back in freehand and you have the experience if guided, going straight experience allows the guided plan to be modified. I didn't mean doing that 100%. It's just more precise. Yes. Computer guided are more precise. There was a study at the University of Paris back in 2005 when Novo BioCare uh, got approval for a uh, Novo clinician. Uh, and they showed that the, uh, the precision was at least 15% greater than doing a freehanded. Absolutely. What I was referring to is that not every case is or can be uh, computer guided. Stefan, two supported, obviously best, but if mucosa supported, would then be Tom use fixation pins? Yes, absolutely. Um, we didn't touch on, on this. I, I didn't get into computer guided. Um, uh, we have so many uh, doctors teaching on computer guided that I didn't want to step on their toes. Um, you do have computer guided uh, uh, webinars, right, Michael? Yeah, we have we have a lot of them. Right, right. I, I, that's why I didn't. I changed mine from that to a uh, to to a uh, prosthetics because uh, I know that they're gonna do that. Okay, let me jump in. We're closing in on two hours. If you're okay continuing to field questions, that's fine. If you have to go, if you want to wrap up, we could take one or two more and then uh, and then finish up. All right. Um, okay. All right. So let's do this quickly. What's your opinion about single implants retaining full denture? Okay, I heard about it. I think it's a little crazy. 
I think whoever used it was just to write a paper. Um, but I don't have much uh, information. If you send me some, uh, I'll gladly research it. Send me the literature, please. Suleiman, uh, I want to add you on WhatsApp. Please give me the whole code for the number. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my number is 305 496 0739. And I think if you're international, you have to put a plus one ahead of that so that it works in your WhatsApp. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. We're going to skip Stefan. You had a bunch, Stefan. I mean, country code. Okay. That was answered. Sha. Any good courses, guidelines for overdentures? Um, if it's surgeries, I recommend ours. Uh, you get to do uh, one or two full large cases during our courses, and we do surgeries and also teach prosthetics in our courses. Uh, Dr. Mungalo, great lecture. Hey, Tuan, how are you, sir? Thank you. Stefan, I'm skipping you. I'm giving other ch people a chance. When does your book release? Where can we buy it? Um, I'm hoping to be printed in, in two months. Uh, uh, hopefully, I'm going to ask uh, Sheldon Lerner to see if he allows me to post it on Blue Sky Bio website, because um, it's going to be very interesting. Okay, Sounds Joseph, uh, do you place multi units the same day of the surgery? Absolutely, yes. Gonzalo, hey Gonzalo. Okay, he's telling me I should close that other window. He says I, he can't see. Okay, all right. Thank you, Gonzalo. Teresa, do you have any tips when the screw loses the inner hexagon? Um, the reason why screws loosen up usually is the occlusal forces are too much. Uh, at that point, uh, make sure that the prosthesis is properly seated. That's probably the number one reason why non-passive uh, prosthesis tends to loosen up screws. Uh, Ray, when taking impressions for implant supported, do you prefer the system in Toro scanners? Uh, they're both good, Ray. Fernando. Okay, I'll, I'll talk to you, Fernando. He's one of my students. Jeffrey, if I leave now, do I get a credit? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. C okay. We're going to send C credits to email, directly to your emails. All right, we have about 10 more questions. I don't know if we have time. Please provide the WhatsApp group details, including the phone number. Right. We have you... Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you prefer to repeat your email and website? Uh, Michael already has it, right, Michael? Yeah, it was sent out to everybody on the chat. Liveimplants.com okay. is the website. Thank you. David, eight micron shim stock. Oh, I thought, it, oh boy, it's even better than I thought. And is S H I M stock. Thank you, sir. Phenomenal. You got to use that. Is this lecture reviewable later on YouTube? Yeah, it's being recorded. It'll be available on blueskyplan.com forward slash webinars 2020 and on YouTube. Yes. Okay. Thank you, David. 12 microns. Bosch. Huh. You know what, David? I got to look up uh, my sources because 12 micron for Bosch. Uh, let me see. I, I got to check him out. I'm going to ask my, my lab. Uh, he's my son. He's a digital lab tech. Uh, I got to ask my sources on that. But thank you. What was the blog info again? Yeah, we covered that. We covered that. Okay. Larga espada. In maxillary, what's the distance between implants? Minimum and maximum. Minimum implant distance between implants is three millimeters. Maximum is six. David, 12 microns. Okay, I think you cover that. Correction. Thank you, David. Eight microns, Bosch, 12 microns. Okay. I guarantee you, David is a prosthodontist. Very good. Thank you. Ina is the last question. Please give your number one more time. I think it's already there. Yeah, repeat the number one more time. I'll send it out to everybody. 305-496-0739. 
0739. Okay, I'm sending that to chat. If I don't answer, it's because I'm writing a book. Do leave me a message. I do get back. Not my secretaries, but me. Uh, this this keeps me my mind off of everything else. It's been a pleasure, Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation and for taking the time to answer all of the many questions that were coming in, for sharing your knowledge. And I'm sure everybody's looking forward to your book being completed. And, Absolutely. Uh, we'll Thank you, sir. I enjoy this. we got to plan another one. This was more fun than I thought. Definitely. We definitely will. And for everybody who's participating, we have the webinars tomorrow as well. And a reminder, you could send me cases for implant planning and we'll plan them live on tomorrow's webinar with Dr. Michael Scherer. Uh, just to repeat, the CE credits are going to be sent to your email, so you'll get those directly to your email account. I'd like to thank everybody for attending, and we hope to see you at future webinar presentations. And Dr. Mangalo, once again, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge. Thank you, sir. A pleasure. And finally, I got to meet you. Uh, I, I got to see your face. Take care, sir. Yeah, take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy. Take care. Thank you.